SEC nerds are into baseball right now, no doubt about that, including our guy Chris Phillips, but we're going to pin him down for some South Carolina football here. You can catch Chris on SEC Unfiltered, or as I just learned, you can just go with SECU. Chris, what's going on today? Mark, it's always great to chat with you, my friend. Yeah, you mentioned and during baseball season, it's baseball season. During basketball season, it's basketball season, but it's football season 24-7, 365. So, yeah, we're we're in the thick, obviously, the college baseball postseason beginning today as we speak with the regionals getting going, 11 SEC teams beginning that road to Omaha. But, Mark, you know, I'm always down to talk some college football, man. It's, uh, you know, it's never too early, and we're exactly 90 days away from kickoff. Before you know it, we're going to be in Dallas for – SEC media days and then fall camp will start and kickoff will be here, Mark. So always a pleasure, man. Excited to chat with you. I got to say, Chris, that uh, during this offseason, South Carolina has been a bit under the radar. No big splashes in regards to transfer portal, anything like that in particular. As you look at this team, as we head toward August, based on what you saw in the spring, any big position battles, storylines that you're looking out for? And Mark, to your point, I mean, I, I think the biggest splash that they made in the transfer portal was earlier, way earlier in the cycle in December when they landed Rocket Sanders. I mean, that that was the big one, right? That was the headliner. That was the name that folks will recognize outside of that. They landed a couple wide receivers that were seldom used at their previous stops. That Some of them were highly regarded prospects, but just not flashy names. Uh, I love the guys they landed in the front seven, a couple linebackers and defensive linemen from the ACC and other places as well. I think they're more athletic there. So in regards to position battles, Mark, you know, Shane Beamer has named Lenora Sellers the starting quarterback, which I don't think is a surprise, but they didn't do that uh, until he went to a Gamecock Club meeting or something like that a couple weeks after the spring game. And he mentioned that battle is going to continue. But, I mean, Mark, I think we all agree that Lenora Sellers is the guy for this football team. I think the biggest position battle, Mark, that South Carolina fans are keeping an eye on, I'm keeping an eye on as well, is – the wide receiver position, you know, who steps up at wide receiver one, and you would think to yourself, well, that's going to be Nick Harbor. Well, Nick Harbor has been busy with track stuff, and he may not even be available to play until like midway through the season, depending on what happens with the Olympics and running track, and this is something they knew when they signed him, but it, it does put Shane Beamer in this South Carolina offense and Dabble Loggins, the offensive coordinator, in a really tough spot, and there's not a there's not a receiver mark on this football team that returns from last year that had more than 12 catches. Now, again, they added a couple of transfer portal guys. They had a, they added a kid from Miami of Ohio who was pretty good last year. They added a kid that was a freshman at Florida State last year that was highly regarded. But they don't have anybody on this roster that is a Juice Wells. They don't even have anybody that's a Xavier Leggett, who even though he was seldom used, you knew he had the potential to be productive in the SEC. I don't know that they have anybody right, that on, right now on the roster that's like that. So – Who's going to be Lenora Sellers' top target on the outside? I would say the wide receiver position. That's the top position battle. Outside of that, it's figuring out both lines of scrimmage, what's the rotation going to be. But that wide receiver battle, I think, is the one that fans are keeping the closest eye on going into fall camp. In the middle of uh, postseason baseball, folks, we tracked down Chris Phillips to talk some South Carolina football. We always enjoy the conversation with Chris. It's been a while, and it may seem like a long time until the guys put the pads back on, but – Think about this, five or six weeks to SEC media days. Once we hit media days, it's right onto the field to work things out for August. Uh, South Carolina, when you look at just this, uh, the, the incoming entries from the Big 12, Oklahoma, Texas, it just adds more depth, more elite possibilities there. Texas was there last year in regards to elite status. Oklahoma, uh, very close as well. When you look at maybe Mississippi State, Arkansas, and I'll put South Carolina in this class, and we would have been talking about Missouri a couple of years ago, so I don't want to totally remove them just based on one eleven win season. There is there a concern that they just get buried under these layers of elite programs and become a bottom feeder in the SEC? Mark, I think there's absolutely a concern. And I think anybody who would tell you otherwise is is just not being truthful to you. Um, you know, when you look at the history of South Carolina football, Mark, without Oklahoma, without Texas, without factoring in who else is in your conference, I mean, let's call it for what it is. South Carolina football has been that sort of bottom third or bottom dweller for basically their entire history outside of a couple pockets of success. Like, let's be realistic about this. Um, you know, you had the pocket of success with Steve Spurrier, 
You know, you were good there for a moment in the 80s with Joe Morrison. Outside of that, you've had a handful of eight-win seasons. I mean, Mark, this is a program that's only won nine or more games seven times in their history, right? And a couple of those, again, were recently 2010 to 2013. So, I mean, it hasn't happened a ton. And I think you add in Texas, you add in Oklahoma, and you mentioned some of the other fan bases, Arkansas, Mississippi State, um, some of those others. You know, I think there's a lot of SEC fans right now that are beating their chest about SEC, SEC, and doing the chant and saying Texas and Oklahoma are going to get humbled. And the scary thought, I think, for some of those fan bases is there's only so many rungs on that ladder. There's now 16 rungs on that ladder, Mark. And Oklahoma and Texas are not coming in the league and going at the bottom and starting at the bottom, right? Texas is starting damn near at the top. And Oklahoma, I think, worst case, is starting in the middle. So, there's going to be a couple of those fan bases that don't realize they're going to be looking up at those two teams. A lot of teams in the SEC are, and I think South Carolina could very well be one of those. This is a huge year. That's why this makes this a pivotal year, Mark. I think, you know, for all of those kind of, kind of mid-tier, middling programs, if you will, that it's like, okay, you know, especially after going five and seven last year, you need to show signs of promise and signs for the future that you're not going to be that bottom tier, like you mentioned, because here's the problem, Mark. With each passing year, you get further and further and further away from what Steve Spurrier did at South Carolina. And the further you get away, the more people are forgetting and the more people are accepting, hey, that really was a blip on the radar. That's not who this South Carolina football program is. They're not even going to be close to that. They're not going to be an eight or nine win per year program, right? They're going to be what they've always been, five and seven, six and six. They'll pull the occasional upset here and there. They'll also lose one that'll make you blow, that'll blow your mind on a yearly basis. And maybe every three to four to five years, they're, you know, they're rattling off an eight and four season. Maybe they're going nine and three. I have no idea. But in regards to doing that consistently and being in the top third of the SEC, things have got to get going in Columbia quickly. Shane Beamer's got to get this thing figured out. Or like you mentioned, you had two more powerhouse programs and South Carolina continues to fall down the rungs of that ladder. Yeah, it's always been a situation for me where you slot Vandy last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just slot them last, and then you look at the rest of the league, and at certain times, like with Arkansas about four or five years ago, there is somebody else that's bad sometimes. And then after that, it's like, okay, you've got programs with issues, Florida, Mississippi State with the turnover at, at the head coach position a couple times in the last few. But there's still teams that have – talent mm -hmm. on the roster that if you sent them to another conference, you would have no issue with them playing in the mid tier of that conference and putting up W. So there aren't a whole lot of rungs, as you say, and it's a concerning situation. If you don't recruit, if you don't keep up with NIL being something that you've got to not just be good or adequate at, you've got to keep up with all the money that's being thrown out in these uh, elaborate collectives that are all over the place in the SEC. Yeah, and Mark, to your point, I mean, you talk about Oklahoma and Texas, and I'm really high on both of those coming in the SEC. Texas more so, I think, Oklahoma with some of the questions they have. On the line of scrimmage and Jackson Arnold being a you know brand-new quarterback, typically in the SEC, Mark, we've seen it before, that's not exactly a recipe for success. I think they're going to be really, really salty defensively, though, and it could give time for you know that young offensive line and Jackson Arnold to really find themselves. By the way, I think Deion Burks at the wide receiver position is going to be a star in this league for Oklahoma. But, again, to your point, you know, you look at like SEC power rankings and stuff like that. Like you mentioned, Vandy at 16, you know, maybe like an Arkansas. But I would even say, Mark, like 10 through 15, you could shuffle in any order and kind of spit out any result. And it would be believable. It would be justifiable, right? Like Arkansas, South Carolina, Mississippi State, Florida. Maybe you throw in Auburn in there. Maybe that might be a stretch. Maybe you throw a Kentucky in there. That might also be a stretch. Either way, you get what I'm saying to your point. You know, normally 10 through 15 in this league could go out and beat a lot of other teams in the ACC or the Big Ten or what have you. So um, I think what's scary is that for those bottom tier teams, again, Texas and Oklahoma, they're not coming in starting at zero. These are both programs, very history rich, tradition rich. They have the infrastructure to win big in this conference immediately and win big for a really, really long time. Like neither one of these programs, Mark, is coming in saying, oh, well, woe is me. The SEC is so hard. Like these are two programs. It does not matter who is lined up across from them. They expect to win. And they expect not just to win. They expect to win big. They expect to win championships. And having that, having everybody on the same page and winning being the main thing, 
It is such an important aspect that I think people don't talk about when it comes to these programs and, you know, achieving the ultimate goals. Oklahoma and Texas have that, and I think you have to question if some of those teams down at the bottom do have that and if they have the right people leading the way. So, uh, again, back to South Carolina specifically, I said it from the beginning when Shane Beamer was hired, and I'll echo this. I really do genuinely, genuinely believe, whether it's Shane Beamer or it's somebody else, I think the South Carolina football program can be consistently a seven to eight win per year program. And every three to four years, either you have the right quarterback or, you know, you won big in the transfer portal or the schedule breaks favorably every three to four years with this 12 team playoff. that's soon going to go to 14 teams. You can challenge to make a college football playoff. I, I think that is a realistic goal and a realistic expectation. And again, whether that's Shane Beamer, whether that's the next guy, I think the program can achieve that because, Mark, you look at them, they have the facilities. They're in a hotbed for recruiting. They've won before, although it feels like, right, that South Carolina, there's even more challenges you have to face. You know, they're on the right track when it comes to NIL. They're doing a good job when it comes to collectives. I'm not saying they're at the top, but it's much better than it was, say, a year or two ago. And also now, you know, you've got this big salary cap thing happening in college football, so that's going to help everybody out, but certainly it's going to help out a school like South Carolina. So I, I say all that, Mark, to say I think it's possible. I think South Carolina can be, and Gamecock fans will will snarl at this, I think they can be kind of like what Kentucky's been over the over the Mark Stoops era, where, again, right now, that's kind of what they are, right, Mark? They're a seven to eight win per year program, and maybe just maybe if a guy like Brock Vandegrift, if he boomed, right, and some other things worked out, Maybe Kentucky's kind of a sleeper upset. Maybe they're a nine-win team. God forbid they get to 10, and their schedule a lot of times does play out favorably. So, again, Mark, I think it can happen, but uh, certainly with Oklahoma and Texas coming in, it only gets tougher. Chris, tell us about SEC Unfiltered. Yeah, man, so SEC Unfiltered, we're all across social media, X, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We're on YouTube, do podcasts, live events, live shows. We go to different stuff. We're, we're going to be doing uh, – we got some really fun things and exciting things planned for the football season, also right now we're covering baseball, of course. We cover baseball, football, basketball. But, uh, yeah, Southeastern Conference media entity um, that is uh, focuses on but is not limited to all the things that I mentioned, Mark. And, again, it's myself. And also we have other contributors, uh, Dave Shoemate, Cole Thompson, Lucas Hill, my guy Harrison Fant, who specifically helps me out with college baseball. Uh, so we've got a team of contributors. Also our website, secunfiltered.com. We've got a staff of writers that we're covering the entire SEC, and uh, I would say the mantra, Mark, of SEC Unfiltered, something I've carried forever, is that the beauty's in the banter. So you can expect that kind of content, man. We like to debate and banter and go back and forth and give our give our takes and opinions and support those and also, again, banter and engage with our audience. So um, it's a lot of fun, Mark. I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it, enjoying every step of the way. And, uh, again, we're going into month six of this thing. So I've never had as much fun as I'm having right now when it comes to making content and covering the best conference of the land. I mean, I don't think there was a better time I could have timed it up, Mark, with Texas and Oklahoma coming in the league. So, uh, yeah, definitely go check us out at SEC Unfilter, wherever you get your content. Chris, as always, we appreciate it. Enjoy the baseball. Mark, appreciate it, man. Hey, kickoff will be here soon, but certainly if you're tuned in to us, make sure you – it's a great weekend to take a load off and watch some college baseball the next couple of weeks.